Now, turning to our two uh, speakers today, uh, Mikhail Sergeyev, who is sort of hosting this particular program, was born and raised in Moscow, received his master's degree in international journalism from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations in 1982. He then moved to the United States and pursued his doctoral program, master's degree, uh, both of which he got from Temple University in Philadelphia. He now works teaching religious studies and philosophy at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, where he received the President's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2010. He has been a Wilmette Institute faculty from about that that time, and he co-chairs our Department of Religion, Philosophy, and Theology. Um, He's also been on the faculty, or currently is on the faculty at Temple University. He has written over 200 scholarly, journalistic, and creative works. He just showed us a marvelous volume he edited on uh, Russian philosophy since uh, the beginning of the 21st century, probably the first volume in English on that topic, and um, something we're quite excited to hear about. Uh, He has also given presentations on philosophical topics in quite a wide range of countries, Canada, all over Europe, uh, here in the U.S. as well. His books uh, have been reviewed in many languages. He's authored and edited 12 books, um, including his monograph, Theory of Religious Cycles, which I enjoyed reading in manuscript form as well some time back. Uh, And he has been awarded, awarded the Nodar how do you say that? Jin literary, literary Prize for the Best Work in Philosophy, the Grand Grand Prix in the category of Journalism and Scholarship. Uh, dialoguing with him today will be Jerry Martin, a colleague of his for some time, raised in a Christian home. When he left college, however, he was no longer a believer. He was interested in the big questions, and so he studied the great thinkers, became a philosophy professor, served as the head of the philosophy department at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and then subsequently he worked at the National Endowment for the Humanities. In addition to scholarly articles on epistemology, the philosophy of mind, and public policy, he wrote reports on education that received national attention and was invited to testify before Congress. That must have been exciting. Martin's life took a different turn when he had a remarkable religious experience, which is reported in his book, God and Autobiography. In 2014, he started the Theology Without Walls project in cooperation with the American Academy of Religion. And these annual discussions led to his landmark publication, Theology Without Walls, the Trans-Religious Imperative, in which 21 theologians from diverse backgrounds and orientations sought to explore uh, spiritual truth. Uh, where, Where do I go? Explore the search for spiritual truth beyond the boundaries of creed and scriptural canon. Jerry Martin now lives in Pennsylvania and is married to Abigail Rosenthal, professor emerita of Brooklyn College of the City University of New York, the author of Confessions of a Young Philosopher, forthcoming A Good Look at Evil, and the blog Dear Abby, the non-advice column. And I suppose that means she gives you a lot of advice as well, or perhaps non-advice. And uh, at this point, I will be very happy to turn the program over to Michael and Jerry, welcome, gentlemen, to our webinar, and we look forward to hearing your discussion today. So again, thank you, Robert, for this nice introduction. I I like those guys you just just described. Uh, Let me add that uh, although I am uh, originally from Russia, I have nothing to do with Mr. Putin, so no obstruction, no hacking, nothing. Uh, I, I, I welcome Jerry to our program, and I'm uh, uh, excited to talk to him about uh, his project, Theology Without Walls and Trans-Religious Experience. Uh, so let me just start with uh, my first question. Uh, in the 20th century, the field of religious studies underwent a profound and striking transformation. Uh, such terms as comparative approach, ecumenical studies, interreligious dialogue have become commonplace in scholarly research, discussion, and literature on the subject. Now, the 21st century has added another innovating concept to those, to those rapidly changing viewpoints, trans-religious experience and theology. Now, we know that ecumenism uh, aims uh, to reconcile differences among various branches or denominations of the Christian religion. We know that interreligious dialogue extends this confessional attitude to other religious traditions. 
So the question is, what is trans-religious theology in this context? And how is it different from, let's say, inter-religious dialogue? Yeah, well, that's a very good question, Mikhail. Um, it's, com it's completely different in the following way. I mean, how does inter interfaith dialogue happens by everyone saying, I'm an X, a Y, or a Z. You know, I'm a Christian, a Jew, a, a Muslim, a Hindu, and I'm going to sort of represent my tradition, and you're going to listen and learn about it. And the ground rules usually include not criticizing anything said. So it's, it's a bit like an, a very polite diplomatic reception. And it's a tremendous learning experience because you're learning not from a textbook about this, that, and the other religion, but from a living embodiment of participant in that tradition. So it's a wonderful thing. And it provides, you might say, materials for theological reflection. Trans-religious theology, what I call theology without walls, takes the, the theological step. That is not a... Um, Interfaith dialogue is normally not a theological enterprise. It's a kind of getting to understand one another enterprise uh, and prefers not to make normative judgments. Theology makes normative judgments about ultimate reality. And um, that's what trans-religious theology sort of takes that elements of dialogue. And now suppose one starts to trying to decide how is one to understand the ultimate reality in light of the reports from the different traditions, the, the revelations, enlightenments, epiphanies, et cetera, in the different traditions? Okay, uh, look, uh, uh, here comes uh, the follow-up question. Um, now, you are talking about theology, but theology is about the study of divine things or uh, the study of God. Um, now, um, do you have, <clears throat> do you need uh, a confessional attitude in order to do transreligious theology, or uh, you don't need that? Because when you do interreligious dialogue, you do this dialogue from the point of view of your own religious and theological background. What about uh, transreligious theology in this respect? Transreligious is completely different in that regard though there are members of our TWW discussions who are very committed to a tradition. And I've always held open the possibility, given the traditions are more flexible than we tend to prefer to think of them as being the uh, history of each, each confession gives a rather rigidified story of its own background. Uh, but in fact, they're very loose, changing, evolving, taking in influences and so forth. And they have a lot of conceptual space. However, the key to trans-religious theology is that you take in the, all the data. You know, if you find divine wisdom somewhere in a tradition, then you credit that in your theologizing, and you credit it without saying, oh, we've got to reinterpret it to fit our beliefs. I mean, that's what happens so often. Uh, so much of this work is done by Christians, and they come and they if they like Hinduism, pretty soon Hinduism is sounding a lot like Christianity. You know, they're, yeah. they're adapting it to their pre-existing beliefs. Humanly, that's a completely understandable thing to do. That's what belief systems do. They take in new things by somehow trying to connect them coherently with what they believe already. However, that is, is not adequate. It's as if you thought... You know, if, if in early modern science, they said, well, we can accept Copernicus, but only if we can reinterpret it in Aristotelian terms. Well, you're, you're not going to have an adequate science if you're always uh, have that uh, what they call confirmation bias going on, that we accept something only if it can fit comfortably within our pre-existing commitments. So the, the, the shocking thing for the people who go to American Academy of Religion who are theologians and often people deeply committed to a tradition and know how to do theology only in terms of, of interpreting that tradition. It's a great shock to them. I think not so much a shock once you step out of that environment and just go to what's going on in the culture, but it's a shock to think, well, what do you mean we're going to, you know, I'm committed to this and now I'm supposed to think more broadly and the answer is yes, if you want an adequate conception of the divine or, or ultimate reality. 
Um, now, you are saying that uh, transreligious theology directs its focus to the analysis and comparison of the ideas about ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimate reality in various religious systems of the world. Now, should this approach presuppose that all religions are speaking about the same ultimate reality? In other words, uh, it seems that one of the assumptions of the project that you are developing is the unity of all religions. Am I correct here or not? I, uh, some of the people in the project would make that assumption, but it's not a requirement. Um, you go and you collect truth wherever, wherever you find it. And if you find it and say the world's seven or nine or whatever it is, great religions, then you would accept them all. You can accept them all as containing part of the truth without, I mean, each one could be 100% true, and yet they're different aspects of the truth. And you only have an adequate view when you put them all together into some larger picture. It's as if the early explorer is finding this or that part of the new world. And then you have to put these early maps they're drawing together to have a larger picture. So, so we have to come to that larger picture. The assumption uh, most of the people doing transreligious theology have trouble on, uh, with the concept of there being multiple ultimate realities. It's almost yeah. just a conceptual requirement that you're trying to find what's ultimate, um, that it's going to be one thing. However, they can all be about that one thing without actually saying the same thing. Those are two different questions. Yes, but ultima, uh, the, the expression ultimate reality presupposes that it is one, because if there are many ultimate realities, they are not ultimate. Yeah, and, and <laughs> actually, ideally, one should be able to step back and consider that question, you know, rather yeah. than just taking it as an, uh, an assumption driven by the semantics of the term ultimate and our habitual ways of thinking, but uh, just conceptually, of the, there are, but in the history of religion, there are views that seem a bit more, you know, Manichaean or something, highly dualistic, uh, maybe Zoroastrianism, depending on how you interpret it, um, that have clashing of realities, even those ultimately seem to have one. Or you have the polytheisms that just have multiple realities, though they all seem to inhabit a common cosmic universe. So. In that sense, there's one thing. Anyway, those are kind of technical conceptual questions that on the most part, we don't need to worry over. If you ask about unity of religions, it kind of depends on what you mean by unity. Um, some people in trans-religious theology think all religions say the same thing, and that's an important thesis to them. Some say they say the same thing at the mystical level, uh, there are arguments about that since the mysticisms themselves tend to be expressed, you know, in beatific vision or, uh, uh, you know, uh, samadhi or something. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, or they say it's, they, they kind of at an ethical level and in some general way, that's true. They all say you shouldn't just be egoistic, greedy, you know, yes, you should keep your word and, you know, so forth. Uh, but again, that's pretty bare, uh, thin gruel for a whole religious conception. But those are, there are those, it's important to notice the commonalities. Uh, but I guess my own bias within uh, trans religious theology is that um, the commonalities allow one to, you might say, appreciate the diversities. Because the, the diversities, we kind of moved away from that in part because they're always at each other's throat with, the, you know, my exclusivism versus your exclusivism. And um, once we come to see, yeah, but at a mystical level, our tradition's very similar. At an ethical level, they're very similar. Well, then we can discuss, well, why are there these other differences? And the differences are also illuminating and shed light on, you might say, certain aspects of the divine reality. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, that is, that is very interesting because I hear you uh, approaching theology, for, correct me if I'm wrong, from a philosophical perspective. Your, um, 
your uh, ultimate education is the education of a philosopher. Yeah. And uh, as you approach this thing as a philosopher, you start uh, with an open mind, uh, with uh, no prejudice about any concept whatsoever, you know, ultimate reality, etc. And you start from empirical evidence. Now, yeah. the, the, the question is, uh, this is a uh, well. This is this is a good approach in in any field of study. But yeah. in the field of theology, the problem with the field of theology is that um, no one has seen God and no one has experienced God. Uh, that's what people think, and uh, therefore, uh, what are the criteria by which you uh, identify the elements uh, of the divine that are true in the scriptures? and the elements of the divine that may not be true in the scriptures. But the fact is, um, I, I call it a fact, this is obviously a judgment. Um, the divine has been experienced many, many times by great figures. You know, the prophets come out and say, yes. the yes. Lord told me the, to tell you the following. <laughs> you know, yeah. And Jesus, you know, does yeah. that. Muhammad uh, it actually had dic took dictation uh, for the Quran and uh, Eastern masters, you know, uh, uh, in the Hindu tradition. And of course, it's a different kind of thing, but the Buddha had an enlightenment. You know, he sat under a Bodhi tree and had an enlightenment that, uh, in his point of view, um, connected him with the fundamental nature of reality. So, um, and that's... And we tend to pick out the, you know, the great names because they're the most obvious ones. But in my own view, people in their daily lives connect with the ultimate. People can go walk in the woods and have a sense of divine presence there. Uh, yes, that's, that's possible. possible. We all, all have something like conscience kind of prompting us, uh-oh, don't do that. <laughs> do this. You know, you're, you're called... Even, even a sense of calling sometimes. You know, you're called upon to help this person. And um, I, I don't think that's our DNA talking. I think those are divine inputs into our conscious process. That's my own view. That we okay. Okay. Know, so, know a lot about the divine reality and are in connection with the divine reality in various ways. So... Uh, in addition to uh, being open uh, to uh, any kind of conception about the divine reality, you also assume your personal subjective view about the presence of the divine uh, everywhere, uh, especially with uh, people and with nature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, wait, wait, wait. I would not call it my <laughs> personal subjective view. I mean, okay. I have a sub subjective view that gravity keeps my feet on the ground. Well, yes, but there's there are reasons for believing that. And I think here too, I've just been rereading William James' Varieties of Human Experience. And there are reasons for thinking, for crediting some experiences and reasons for doubting others. And these are not merely subjective. They are, you know, it's a bit like we often are thinking so much of scientific paradigm or in terms of the facts in the world almanac, you know, the, this mountain is such and such high. Um, but we also make aesthetic judgments. We make ethical judgments. We acquire kind of life wisdom. What's really important in life? You know, what, what is it to be human? What's, what's the heart of that? And these are, you could call them all subjective, but there is a wisdom literature that informs us, and there's some degree of agreement, in fact, among thoughtful people of what, of, you know, might say the canon of wisdom literature includes. And we all go read the Bhagavad Gita, whether we're Hindus or not, for example. And we may read great works of literature, East and West, again, regardless of our own cultural tra uh, tradition, and learn from them. And that learning can be defended rationally. You know, it's not just, uh, I like vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I was using the term subjective, not in the way you uh, took it. Uh, subjective, not as something that is, you know, illusory or uh, related to only one person. Uh, 
uh, as contrasted to objective reality. No, I, I meant subjective in terms of the inner experience of the person, uh, yeah. which is, is of course, uh, as reliable as uh, uh, the laws of nature, yeah. uh, especially for that person. Yes, of yeah. course. And, and for many people, <laughs> so again, that judgment about uh, across the religions, you find similar agreement on, on right and wrong, on, on ethical yeah. norms. Uh, you can call that subjective in the sense it's not like measuring the height of Mount Everest. But on the yeah. other hand, it uh, comes as a result of a, of a rational process that's integrated with life because about these things, reason is not just a logical apparatus. It uh, comes out of life experience that you reflect on life and you see yes. what's right and what's wrong and what's important and what's less important and uh, what's, what's noble and what's ignoble. Uh, well, uh, let me just um, continue my line of questions about ultimate reality and the knowledge of ultimate reality. Yeah. Uh, you know that in many religions, uh, in many religious traditions, the ultimate reality is expressed either through metaphors, uh, poetic descriptions, symbolic terms, or negative definitions the so-called via negativa. Um, so as a result, uh, here is the question. Is it productive to compare and contrast our understanding of uh, some ultimate reality that uh, almost always escapes any definitive knowledge? Um, well, if, if one has to be very careful in these discussions not to set up a false, a kind of idol of uh, objective knowledge or knowing something of language that applies to its, its a referent. Um, language works in many ways. I was having this discussion with one of my TWW colleagues about ineffability, you know, that uh, what's ultimate is unsayable, you often read. And she said, as far as I'm concerned, the taste of a banana is ineffable. You know, how are you going to communicate to that to someone, right? Well, and right maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> taste it, you got it. And, uh, and uh, with some taste, and banana was a good example, some taste you can say, well, it's kind of like nutmeg or something like that. You find a close approximation to communicate. But uh, then they need to know what nutmeg tastes like, or that's not going to be helpful. Um, uh, Religious language is elusive, and uh, I would just say elusive. There's no reason to think, how do I want to say this? I tend to be on the pro-literal side in that debate. This is just a personal view. It's not a doctrine or assumption of theology without walls. Um, but I often feel, I actually think, for example, that God loves us. And you can say, well, that's just a metaphor. God doesn't love us the way we love each other. Well, that's true. God isn't like us. Uh, I think my dog kind of loves me. <laughs> but it's not quite like the way I love my wife, right? But it's an appropriate thing. My dog wants to go for a walk. It's perfectly obvious. The dog comes with the leash in, in mouth, you know, or tail wagging. Um, so the dog has wants that are inarticulate. And yet we recognize, and language can jump over these barriers. The divine reality is a very unusual kind of reality. So it's not, that does not mean that it's so bizarre, so distant, that there's no way to capture it at all. And in fact, if you say that, it's almost like the people who want to metaphorize, God can't love us, and almost all the High theologians in the Christian traditions do that, uh, becomes a metaphor. It's as if I, I kind of have this vision, God is up there trying to love us, <laughs> you know, sending us waves of love, and we're, oh, well, it's just metaphor. You know? So it, it, it interferes with the ways in which the divine does communicate with us to keep throwing it in the bucket of metaphors. I mean, there, there's a positive and useful side to that, so I don't want to overstate my point. 
because a lot of the most interesting recent work in theology, a lot from feminist theologians, has been, well, let's rethink some of our metaphors, king, shepherd, and so forth, and think, are these really adequate? Uh, and that's a very useful thing to do, uh, that uh, you're always using a basket of language that can be reevaluated. We do that all the time for a variety of fields. You study the history of science, you know, see a, a term like mass or energy has undergone a series of redefinitions over time. Uh, and that's just how human development works. But uh, anyway, uh, the fact that, uh, that the divine is difficult to talk about does not mean the divine is impossible to talk about. And it doesn't mean that because you can't know uh, the divine and the way you know the chemical elements doesn't mean you don't know the divine at all. And in fact, we kind of know a lot about the divine. Uh, you know, why do we think the divine is sort of benign? There are traditions in which the, benign, the divine isn't, and there are arguments about that. Why is there evil in the world if the divine is benign? And there are various ways of discussing it. But uh, it's what John Hick called cosmic optimism. There's a kind of cosmic optimism built into religions. And not just that they're built into religions as cultural phenomena, but that are built into the religious attitude, the religious life, the spiritual life, that you're picking up on what's positive in the divine presence in reality. Anyway, that's one way of discussing it. Yeah, uh, uh, I admire your optimism. And I hear that this is a genuine American optimism, uh, which uh, is, uh, well, how shall I put it, which is fighting my traditional Russian pessimism. <laughs> right. In fact, William James is very good on this. The optimism reflects something true about reality. So does the pessimism. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The, 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 the best. Yeah. Uh, la, la, la. Let's skip down the block, you know. Uh, the, best, the best feature of pessimism is that um, it uh, allows you to adjust to uh, reality. You know, when you expect nothing uh, good to happen, whatever happens is better than you expected. <laughs> well, and, uh, you, you, you always have some, uh, you know, excuse to be cheerful. <laughs> yeah, that, that, thing, <laughs> that things maybe can't get worse. <laughs> than, than uh, but, um, you know, there are deep, deep, I just read a good paper by one of our TWW people, on the, you know, what, what tragedy tells us about the ultimate. We've had a couple of papers about that. And, uh, and I guess my own view, there's a tendency very strong in the Christian tradition, make everything goody goody and to sweep the negative under the rug. And I guess I'm quite against that. This is part of reality too. And my own view is, okay, God has to cope with that as, as, just as we do. Uh, uh, well, that, here, here, yeah, here I agree wholeheartedly because I think God is uh, specializing in tragedies, uh, especially, <laughs> especially, especially in dystopias. Yeah. Uh, people, people are uh, trying to portray utopian visions which never come true. No, um, and utopian um, visions are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> they turn into nightmares. But yeah. uh, something there's a lot to be said for the spiritual vitality of a kind of good, hard-headed, common sense attitude to life. That life is going to have ups and downs, and. In the end, you might say it tends to have a great big down, you know, old age, infirmity, illness, yeah. death. Um, but those are part of the whole story. And so if you understand the whole story, you got to have an account of those too. And it can't just be, oh, well, it's all for some good. It's made up in the afterlife. You know, Kant tried to say that. And uh, how does this child burning in a hotel fire? you know, an yeah. infant burning in a hotel fire, how can heaven be good enough to make up for that? You know, it's just... Yeah. It's just that, is, that is the question of Dostoevsky. Yes. yes, that, yes. That, that, that is the question of Dostoevsky. Yes. And that's the depth of Dostoevsky. Yeah. You know, it's a deeply religious writer of all, you might say, and yet he faces these issues head on. 
Yeah, Father Zosima's body stinks like the others to their shock. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the most yeah. holy man anybody knows. And he decomposes like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let me add to that that all uh, the idea of all human rights actually has its roots as its root has its roots in the God given right uh, to go to hell. Oh, um, is that right? And right. hell because we choose, and yes. we choose up, we choose down. That's yes. our choice. That's a good point. That's a good point. That's the essence of free will is the uh, possibility of embracing evil. Yeah, that's so, uh, yeah, let me stop talking about evil because that will lead us <laughs> astray. <laughs> <laughs> let me come back to uh, our topic. Uh, I have uh, several questions about Christianity because uh, f- uh, from my perspective, Christianity would represent a special difficulty in trans-religious theology uh, because Christianity's uh, worldview is exclusive, at least it was uh, for uh, millennia. So how do you deal with the claims of uh, religious exclusivity, for example, in Christianity? And uh, how do you deal with the Trinity, which is a unique understanding of the Supreme Being? Um, well, let's take these one at a time, the ex- yeah. exclusivity. Um, the, um, I think it's perfectly natural to a religion, even apart from Christianity, to feel exclusivist in the following sense. You know, once you discover the deepest insight you can find about life, then you think, wow, this is it. And anybody who hasn't found the insight you found, you know, it could be a philosophy, it could be a literary mode, you know, a cultural concept, a, po- a political agenda. Once you find that, then you think, well, everyone else is missing the boat. You know, they're talking nice, but they're missing the thing I see. And I rather... I'm not angry, you might say, at the exclusivist, as many of my more pluralistic colleagues are. And I think the way any enterprise develops, you start by holding on to the truths you know. And if if Christianity has given you genuine access to the divine, well, you don't slam that door closed. You may be puzzled as you encounter others, and maybe they have truth also. So that's a completely natural human activity. But, you know, one always thinks of the revolution of Einstein coming along, but all of Newton is present inside Einstein. He didn't throw Newton out. It's, a, a, it's, it's the biggest chapter, you might say, in Einstein's physics. Um, so we do that. And so I sometimes, when I'm talking to a group about these issues, I I, I just kind of stress there's a truth in exclusivism that you have found, and I'm assuming there are always these epistemological questions. Uh, you know, did you just wander in as a kind of bunch of slogans to you and, and not a serious life appropriation or intellectual um, appropriation? But assuming that you have entered into it, connected with the divine through that means then uh, you should hold on to that. However, as a theo, especially if you're a theologian, there's a somewhat, theologians have obligations that or the, the parish Christ, Christian does not have for understanding adequately the entire, you know, the divine reality. You, you've got to say, and I think the better churches said this, well, we believe this is true and this gets you salvation. However, we recognize that God is bigger than our religion, than our tradition, and God was at work in other traditions. This is roughly, I think, speaking the Catholic current official view. God's working in these other traditions, too. And um, they only have a big problem where they seem to directly contradict Christianity, but it's harder to identify direct contradictions than one would think. Uh, they're saying different things, but that's not exactly, they're not saying there's no incarnation. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes they say that when they're in, in a kind of polemical mode. You find that in some Islamic writings and it's polemical. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but in other moments, they, they're, they're more generous. Even that tradition is more generous. And, uh, uh, and it's not clear, a, a, a very interesting work, uh, should say the 
Theology Without Walls volume of essays that we published, the Trans Religious Imperative, includes, I specifically invited people who are sympathetic critics of Theology Without Walls, in part because sympathetic critics, not dismissive critics, but people who understand what you're doing and why you're trying to do it, but see this problem, this problem, this problem. It includes people who are Christian and insist on being confessional Christians. Uh, Father Francis Clooney is one, Mark Heim is another. Mark Heim in particular has done this extraordinary series of books, first of which actually made the striking, uh, I'm now forgetting the name of it, uh, Salvations, Salvations in the plural. Mm -hmm. Each tradition offers a kind of salvation, you know, using that term now more broadly, stretching the term to include Buddhist enlightenment and so forth. They each identify a problem for the Buddhist with suffering, and they each offer a solution to the problem they've identified. And what he is saying is, well, darn, he uses Dante's Inferno as an example, because mm -hmm. in the Inferno, you've got the lovers there. And they're getting what they wanted. They're eternally uh, smooching, you know. And, uh, but that's all they get. That's all they get. They never move up. Plato and Aristotle are down in Inferno. So they had high-minded philosophy. But that's all they get. <laughs> so he puts these other uh, uh, of, uh, salvations in that category. And then in a subsequent book, book The Depth of the Riches, argues that the Trinity somehow has it all. I, I can't quite restate the argument, but it has the unity of the divine, that has the diversity of the divine, a major Christian argument or theistic, and the Abrahamic <laughs> argument against Eastern religion is that uh, Easterns tend to like something more like merging. And uh, the Western tradition says no relationship is what we're after, not merging. And as one of them says, I, I want to taste the sweetness, not be the sugar. <laughs> you know, it's a different mode. And of course, you got Mark Kimes saying, well, the Trinity itself is a model of relationships and so forth. Um, so there, what he's doing is a very encompassing version of what in the end would have to be called a kind of exclusivism because he thinks the Christian story is the ultimate story. Uh, that, and I don't go that way, but it's a, it's, it's possible to acknowledge an awful lot of the adequacy of the divine revelation through other religions uh, and to do so while still sticking within one's own. Uh, others, for others, it's a wrenching thing. They can't do that. Uh, and, um, and that's too bad. Uh, but my own view would... Uh, uh, is that each would be more put this way, each has part of the story. They're, they're engaging the divine in a different way. In fact, the old uh, blind man and the elephant is a perfect parable for my point of view. The elephant is a real thing, it's not ineffable. Each one has an, uh, a bit of it, one's grabbing the trunk and another the tail, another the big ears, floppy ears, and they each, project that onto the whole, as if that's the whole story. The whole thing is like a snake-like tail, so it must be a snake. Um, that, of course, the blind men uh, are also seem to be mute because it doesn't occur to them to talk. You know, I've got it from this side, I'm finding this, I'm finding a tree trunk like, maybe it's a leg, you know? And if you did that, they started talking, you could piece together a picture that would be fairly adequate to the elephant. Um, but since they don't talk to each other, and each one is a kind of exclusivist in that classic blind man and the elephant story, theology cannot progress beyond what they knew coming in. They didn't. They knew what they knew almost before. Well, I don't know how to carry on this metaphor, yeah. but anyway. Um, so you you basically present your uh, project of uh, theology without walls as as those people speaking to each other, speaking to each other, at least spe at least speaking to each other. Yeah, but speaking to each other, not quite like old interfaith dialogue. We may interfaith dialogue may evolve, as you know. Our friend Leonard Swidler has the concept of the deep dialogue. People talk to each other enough, they start influencing each other, even though nobody's trying to persuade or convert anybody. 
But you think, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> you know, that sounds kind of true, doesn't it? What this person has said. But there's nothing wrong. And maybe this is a way in which I'm also a philosopher. Um, uh, philosophers always disagree with each other. You disagree, and part of what they learn to do is to disagree within uh, norms of uh, treating each other well humanly and just trying to follow the reasoning without ego investment. When it's done right, you do it without ego investment. You just follow, huh, you've got, you've got a good point there. You know, you say to the other one, they say, well, isn't your religion kind of defective on this point? And you kind of, instead of getting your back up, you say, huh, that's an interesting point. Let me think about that. Maybe it is. Maybe this is a place my religion needs to grow or develop or, or emphasize something it has downplayed. So that would be the kind of vital dialogue that would advance trans-religious theologizing. So you mentioned uh, panels on uh, theology without wall at the American Academy of Religion. Yeah. Uh, you've done uh, a number of them. Um, and as a result of this scholarly effort, you published uh, a book on the subject. Yeah. Now, wh what are other topics, comparative or controversial or of any other kind, uh, that were raised by the representatives of those various religious traditions. Uh, what is your experience? Um, well, again, in this context, people aren't coming in as representatives of traditions, with, with a few exceptions. Uh, Francis Clooney has generously participated in some of our sessions, but always insists on the adequacy of the Catholic confession uh, to if not now, as time goes on, encompass all the truth found elsewhere, <laughs> you might say. Something like that. I don't want to put words in his mouth. But you have people like that. But mostly, um, uh, the people themselves are often kind of multi-religious. Paul Knitter has written this remarkable book, Without Buddha, I Couldn't Be a Christian. And he's now as he first started out a Christian doing some Buddhist meditation, became equally Christian and Buddhist, and now he's almost more Buddhist than Christian. But he does think that while he deeply believes Christians have a lot to learn from the Buddha, the Buddhists have some important things to learn from the Christians. And I think one of the, he's a liberation theologian also, and he's thinking the area of concern for, you know, uh, widows and orphans that you find in the Old Testament, the concern for social justice. Um, the Buddhists tend to be, well, this is a level of unreality anyway. <laughs> you know, kind of, you, you don't fight it, you, you carry forth your inner peace. I don't know if that's adequate to Buddhists, but he's making, in, in the very essay, he contributes an essay to the, the TWW volume, and uh, that's kind of what he's doing in that essay. And um, John Tatonimal's essay is uh, um, about interreligious wisdom. That's his conception of TWW, the quest for interreligious wisdom. And he makes, among other things, an argument for what he calls first order theological mm -hmm. understanding. And that you shouldn't just be studying the text, don't just go read. Uh, the Four Noble Truths and, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and so forth, engage in meditation, Buddhist-style meditation, Hindu-style you know, yoga. <laughs> you do these yeah, things. practical matters. And, you're, and as he sees it, it's a bit like what I was saying is my point of view. As he sees it, you're participating in the divine life, in an aspect of the divine life. And so... The more of these, and we have another essay by Peter Savistano, who's in the Philadelphia area, um, 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 there was this statement made against, you know, running around and participating in different religions that would, well, if you wanted to reach water, would you dig, dig six 10-foot holes or one 60-foot hole? And so that's a kind of put down of running around and having these thin understandings. And he writes, well, why not 10 60 foot holes? And he's done that in his life in an amazing way, has done, does 
meditation and this or that spiritual discipline and a variety of traditions, including like Russian Orthodox, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to the point he's like a certified master in Zen, <laughs> one thing and another. His own well, to Christian. It will, it will be difficult for him to do this in Russian Orthodoxy because you cannot even uh, partake communion if you are not baptized into Russian Orthodoxy. Okay, so, <laughs> so he's not going to be a master there. There's something else you can do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, not that's for sure. I mean, there is some kind of Eastern Orthodox, but yeah there, yeah, there are a lot of people who can't take the Eucharist and so forth, who nevertheless can learn a lot from Christianity, from even. Yes, I yeah. agree, I agree. That's perfectly clear. And so that's just, you know, there are all these different ways of approaching it, but each one of these you can see isn't, oh, I as a Christian am objecting to this, or I as a Hindu, one of our earliest participants is Jeffrey Long. Uh, he's also in Eastern Pennsylvania, <clears throat> Elizabethtown College, but born a Catholic. His father, when he was just a, child, a, a boy, had a tragic death, uh, taking his own life, which oh, the Catholic tradition, of course, is a mortal sin. Yes. And young Jeffrey, well, well that just doesn't seem fair. You got this one life, and then for all eternity, <laughs> you know, this one mistake, and he had horrible conditions leading to, uh, he had been hit by a train or something and mangled. And, uh, you know, what, what was life going to be for, for him? And so he took his life. And then young Jeffrey came across at a flea market um, a copy of the Bhagavad Gita and somebody dying and Krishna saying right on the front that this isn't the end. <laughs> you know, death, is, death isn't quite real or something to that effect. And he felt, well, gee, this is, a message for me, <laughs> you know, and, and now he's probably, uh, in a scholarly way, the leading American scholar on um, Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna. Oh. So anyway, you know, people have these courses, and I asked him when he wrote one thing for us, maybe it was a journal special issue, and he kind of told us of that story, but could you go back and add is there anything you retain from your Catholic upbringing that you still consider valuable and part of your total picture of the world? And he, he did that. And of course, there were things. People tell stories of their lives one way, and then often you go back and, well, there is this whole other element that you tell it a different way looms large. And so, so people have their own experiences, something I'm now writing picks up and it's part of my, my personal model for how one would do theology without walls. Um, uh, the world's religions could be seen as a great library, though it's more than a library, of course, because it's not just books, it's people's lives, rituals, ways of living, uh, I iconic figures, you know, saintly and whatever, figures, um, they provide you this wealth of spiritual insight. <laughs> and now that it's all available, each before our globalization, each one, when they weren't fighting the next door neighbor, was just cultivating their garden, you might say. They were trying for the deepest understanding of their own tradition that they could come to. And that sounds like a reasonable thing to do, right? Um, you got a deep, rich tradition, and it's uh, nobody exhausts their home tradition ever in terms of its full uh, religious potential. But we now have it all available to us, and uh, and I, John Tatamano often has these nice down to earth Im images, down to earth images. Said, you know, it's kind of like a big spice cabinet from which you can make either Italian dishes or Indian dishes. He was born in India of a Christian family. You can make either, or I add, or mix them and create new cuisines. Not everything has to be Italian or Indian, right? You create new cuisines, fusion cuisines, or, or just invented cuisines. Hey, this tastes good. <laughs> the analogy would be 
looking at these in this way makes more sense of spiritual reality than not looking at them this way, even if it's an unusual combination of elements. And I was going to say something I'm working on now, just for a presentation, is I picked up on something in Bhagavad Gita. Everybody reads Bhagavad Gita. Uh, if there were a world canon, that would certainly be in it. Uh, and there's a place where early in the Bhagavad Gita where um, Krishna says, uh, better to do your own dharma even if poorly than somebody else's dharma well. Now, in the very traditional Hindu social structure, that meant stick to your caste. But as time goes on, you know, you look at something like that and caste, I don't know anybody who thinks one of the great gifts to the world of, of Hinduism is caste concept of caste, even though it's absolutely central to the tradition. But as time goes on, these things uh, become avenues for new insights. And uh, the way I'm picking up on it, and I asked my Hindu friend, Jeffrey Long, this, uh, is this a perceptible, uh, an acceptable reading, um, is I tend to th be thinking in myself very personal terms, that Jerry has a calling, Mikhail has a calling, a uh, Rob, who was here introducing us, has a calling. And one's task in life is to figure out, in religious terms, what is my best access to the divine? Maybe it's Baha'i. Maybe it's to stay a Catholic, but maybe thinking about it a little differently. Or what? Or, or some, some third thing. Maybe it's to, uh, I've met a couple of people who are rather very serious about Stoic wisdom. And well, that's a great wisdom tradition that tends to be overlooked and by the religion people because they're thinking of the religions, you know, the kind of officially designated religions, but they're, the wisdom traditions are rather broader than that. And, uh, but anyway, Jeffrey said, uh, he, he hasn't yet been able to give me a source. I'd like to be able to cite something that sort of sanctions my reading. But uh, he said, it's his impression that younger Hindus in India are taking it a bit my way. And part of that is uh, a kind of increasing individualism in the world, disaffiliation and increased uh, individualism, which uh, is a mixed blessing. It's got pluses and minuses. But from my point of view, uh, it, it's a, a crucial task in life. You've got to, if you're born a Catholic, you've got to decide still whether to stay a Catholic. And yeah. if something else comes along, Maybe you should do that, or maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you try that, and no, no, you're, you, you connect with God much better in the Catholic frame. You go back to that. That's a very individual decision. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, I think I would agree with you uh, here. And uh, I have one more question before we move on to our viewers and their questions. But I uh, think you already answered that, or at least uh, I uh, think I know what the answer would be. Yeah. Uh, the question about the ultimate goal of your uh, scholarly initiative, of your scholarly enterprise. Practically speaking, what would you like to accomplish with uh, this project of uh, uh, theology without walls and transreligious experience? Yeah, the minimum goal from a, on the scholarly side, the minimum goal is for theologians to start thinking in non-exclusivist ways, and not in the simple pluralism that's a sort of bland, you know, stand back and admire them all, like their pictures of an exhibition, but engage them in much the way I'm talking about with the Bhagavad Gita, where one section struck me, I don't have to become a Hindu <laughs> to appreciate that section, to take something from it, I have the freedom to adapt it to my understanding. And we can do that with the various elements of different traditions. That, so I, I think of it a lot as, uh, as a kind of sorting. What, what, you know, of the different traditions, what are the parts that are really, really good? And what are the parts that are less good? Like the caste system is, is less good, even if you try to reinterpret it and get something more valid out of it, it's less good. And we, in fact, do that to every religion. People say, oh, you can't judge. Well, we do judge. And we don't just judge by, oh, this sounds more Christian or more X, Y, or Z. Uh, this sounds more true. 
is how we do it. This sounds like more wisdom. So I would like to ultimately, you know, we start out inching that direction, but ultimately for theologians, however they're trained, and um, to think quite broadly and with all the elements of divine wisdom available in their thinking and taken in, you might say, without prejudice to their origins. So if they're at the Ebo in West Africa, have this, I uh, just read some stuff about them, very interesting. Um, so if they have an insight, take that into account in your theologizing. And, and there's also, the, in, in spiritual life, the, uh, the aim of theology ultimately isn't to have uh, ultimate theoretical construct of yeah. the universe, but it's to live. Yes. The most spiritual life possible. Well, and you want to live vis-a-vis the best understanding of ultimate of divine reality that you can have. And if that's a little more diverse and complex than uh, just growing up in one tradition, so be it. Uh, it's going to be more adequate. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jerry, um, so we have only one question so far from Farid Sabet. Uh, uh, wonderful discussion. Are we collectively losing the aptitude for the wisdom traditions in modern culture of materialism slash social media slash addictions? Yes, yes, yes. I don't think Twitter has a lot of wisdom tradition <laughs> being communicated through it. Maybe uh, the Pope tweet tweets. <laughs> Who's yes. Saying, maybe there's some way that wisdom can be tweeted too if we are inventive enough. But it's something I've uh, toyed with as an idea. In fact, I considered uh, after I left NEH, maybe it's what I would go do is start a, wi- a program called a, wi- a wisdom program. I was thinking of an undergraduate level because we're so niched into professional disciplines yeah. at the PhD level. It's something William James warmed about wrote a wonderful essay called A PhD Octopus. He saw how it was going to destroy liberal education as everyone became niched as specialists. And uh, and that certainly has happened. And it happens in the field of religion, theology. And uh, But it'd be wonderful. Um, because some people are reading, now I'm forgetting the name of the Frenchman who's written about the Stoics and so forth, Foudot or some name like that. Anyway. Uh, he's, those people were teachers of wisdom, the ancient Greek philosophers. They lived in communities. In fact, they were pre- prelude, prelude to the monastic movement. The Platonists all lived together. The Epicureans lived together. And so for the Stoics, of course. Um, but then there are many other sources of wisdom. Uh, trans-religious, the trans really also is meant to suggest, though it's uh, very hard to get the people in a religious studies environment to go this way, but we should look at the great literature. And I don't mean the great literature that's considered religious because it has the name Christian on it, like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, but you know, Shakespeare, Greek tragedy, Eastern liter- literature, uh, the story of the stone. That, that should all be part of education, yeah. uh, but it is not. No, no it not. is not. No. and. Uh, uh, just in a way, St. John's College Good Core Curriculum <laughs> would be close to this. Uh, but you could have in a modern secular university, a, uh, and if you talk about wisdom, you know, the, in a secular university, most of our students go to great big secular universities, 80,000 students on one campus, that kind of thing. And, and you can't make normative religious judgments in that context, separation of church and state and so forth, controversy. Um, so you just study the religions as objects, or as one friend of mine says, like yeah. taking a course on um, everything about cheese, the history and economics and, and, and culinary facts about cheese, with, but they say, but you can't taste any. <laughs> you can't taste any. Well, what would that be? A course on swimming, where the one thing you can't do is dive into the water and swim. Uh, and yes, that situation we've gotten into. But wisdom traditions, one could study the, those traditions and soak up the wisdom and eva- you know evaluate it, make normative judgments about what great truths you found there. 
Uh, look, I think personally, the one of the problems of uh, contemporary American education is uh, 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 making everything look like science. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you, you, you want to find some uh, quantitative way to measure the humanistic progress, which is impossible, yeah. uh, a priori. Uh, so uh, you, you cannot really teach uh, wisdom uh, by thinking about your goals and what what steps you want to achieve, <laughs> right. there, there is no step by step goal to be uh, step by step way to become wise. Um, as I, I always say, say to my students, um, you know, if you if you want to become a genius, you should not uh, go through the university. Look at Dostoevsky's example. You know, back to Dostoevsky. Um, he almost got uh, executed, and his execution was replaced by uh, six years of uh, hard uh, work, uh, hard labor in Siberia. And those six years of hard labor in Siberia changed him radically. Really? Uh, he, he only had one book to read, the Bible. Everything else was forbidden. And uh, uh, <laughs> after, he, after he came from Siberia, he came a changed man. Isn't that something? And became Dostoevsky. Yeah, actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, only only uh, unusual ways can uh, bring wisdom, not just step by step techniques. Um, look, we have more. We have more questions. Uh, Shayan Nik Akhtar uh, uh, says, writes, "Thank you so much for the talk. My question is for trans theological dialogue." Uh, wouldn't it require that each theologian from different religious background have the same criteria for wisdom? Otherwise, how do you think theologians could recognize wisdom in other traditions if what is considered wisdom is different in each religious tradition? Yes, yes. That, that's a wonderful question, and it's the most natural question in the world. Um, uh, there's a book on... Uh, to, Catherine Corneal has edited a number of, of books on multiple religious topics, and one of them is on criteria. Uh -huh. and, and she does the typical thing, which trans-religious theology would not do. She's a confessional theologian with an interest in all of these religions. She has some, a representative of each religion say how, how, I can't remember how she framed the question, but how would you recognize wisdom? Yeah. And each one said, well, if it conforms to our doctrines X, Y, Z, yeah. you know, each one had to conform to our doctrines. Um, and that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong approach. What I, there's a bit of a, well, I sometimes just call it the criteriological fallacy that we inherited from Descartes, who argued that before you could get any knowledge, you first had to figure out what the criteria for knowledge were. And... Uh, uh, but in fact, knowledge works in the opposite direction. Uh, you first you think about wine, the standards for good wine. You didn't start off before you'd ever tasted wine with the criteria for what's a good wine. You taste a lot of wine and discuss it with other people and so forth, and maybe you evolve some criteria. Um, and that's how all these more subtle areas of life, practical wisdom, you know, uh, who, who has savvy about living through life? You don't have the criteria for savvy in advance or for the successful statesman. You look at the models that are based on historic experience. Um, uh, so then the problem with the criteriological fallacy is that it creates a kind of like an egocentric trap. It's as if, well, I judge everything by me, by my standards. And so it's a closed entity, a closed circle. And therefore, nobody can step outside that if you start thinking that way. But in fact, the very nature of consciousness is to be outside itself. Consciousness is taking in the world, the surroundings. We would not have survived as a species if we did not have that capacity. And through taking in reality and having experiences and things that work and things that don't, we develop criteria. So there are no criteria in, uh, in advance. I mean, you start off with a rough set of criteria maybe, but 
you refine those, and by the end, you might have thought, oh, well, some of my early ideas about what the you know what defines wisdom were really rather wrong. Uh, I may have overly taken the Stoic conception, whereas not having not being subject to your feelings is the essence of wisdom. Is to detach, is to not be cast about by feelings about circumstances you can't control. Uh, but well, that's that doesn't cover all cases. What about Liz, wisdom and romantic love, for example? You know, I mean, all these other domains of life is, are those feelings wrong? <laughs> you know, you shouldn't uh, have that deep love that I certainly have for my wife. But that's wrong, and and so so these get discussed, refined, elaborated, and and probably enriched. And we don't even have to have a boiled down single set of criteria for wisdom or spiritual truth or any of these things. It can be a, a, any more than we have for art or ethics. When you go to the hard questions, you just mm -hmm. we have um, sufficiently structured ways to reason about those things and to experience them in refined ways. Art often requires that. You have to develop an eye and then you can see or an ear if it's music. And so, and we never need to be just bound by our initial set of assumptions. Okay, so experiential, experiential. Yeah, it's experiential, right and intellectual as well. That's part of the experiential is you're developing yeah. thinking along with experiencing. Uh, Nan Ackerman uh, asks, does religion without walls see the various religious traditions as progressive over time? As what over time? As progressive, progressing progressive. over time. Um, um, oh, they change. Uh, I tend myself not to have historical, large historical theories about progress or regress or or cycles. You have a theory of cycles based on an evidentiary uh, record that supports that theory. Um, and... Uh, 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 but uh, anyway, I think theology without walls invites either point of view or not taking up that question. It, depend on, it would be, depend on the inquirer whether you felt that was an important question for your understanding of things. And if it was, then uh, you'd want to pursue that investigation and figure out, well, our religion is progressing, <laughs> you know, and Again, back to criteria kind of thing, you know, what, how, how can we tell uh, that they are? And you might say, well, you might name a number of things if someone feels they're progressing. There seem to be, we seem to be in a period of a lot less exclusivity, uh, not just with regard to religion, but all kinds of categories. And, uh, and you could consider that a pro progress, for example. Okay, uh, Nancy, unfortunately, I do not know her uh, last name, <clears throat> is asking, what approach do you take to the immense diversity of religious experience? How do you, should you, separate the idiosyncratic and the cultural from the unity behind them? Um, well, again, in my view, one isn't just looking for unity. One's trying to appreciate both unity and diversity, and the fact that things are the aspects in which things are diverse. If uh, prayer is not the same as yoga, for example, doesn't mean you need either need to merge them or throw one of them out. Uh, they can be different modes of access to the divine, and as some people like to put it, different uh, um, ways of participating in the divine life in different ways of God, you might say, participating in your life. Um, so uh, and there, there is still the remaining. The other part of, of, of the question uh, is there's still, nevertheless, certainly the idiosyncratic. And by, by idiosyncratic, I take it we don't mean merely unusual. Uh, some of the most interesting views of the world may be held by one person, but it may be a root view that seeing something the rest of us are simply have overlooking. But I assume her question is about 
idiosyncratic in the sense of, you know, flaky, un ungrounded, just uh, part of the flotsam and jetsam of that person's consciousness. I have, I have some explanation from Nancy, uh, yes. whose uh, yes. last name I now know. Uh, okay. Nancy Zukovsky uh, is writing, as, yes. a social, as a social worker, I have to recognize cultural competency. Yes. Yeah, in counseling, I create a space where people can explore their sense of spirituality and religious traditions. I sprinkle my experience into the therapeutic dialogue. Yes, yes. Well, that's a wonderful example. And that's uh, roughly speaking uh, what those people call spiritual directors would do. They're to help whatever their own uh, affiliations, they're to help that person find their way. And Nancy is quite right that you have to have to understand people, each other. We have to have a high level of cultural competence. And that's not just because people are from, you know, different countries or something like that, but within a country, different regions, different social classes, levels of education, formative life experiences, talking to a guy who spent his whole life as a trucker, for example, totally different set of life experiences. And so kind of to understand why he's saying what he's saying. I need to set it against that background. And I'm sure Nancy knows, could say much more than what I just said about that. Uh, and, uh, but it, it is funny. I, my own sense is that although you do all those things to see where somebody's coming from, you can still see, well, there's more to the person than the, their cultural conditioning. And, uh, and in part, I guess what Nancy is thinking, well, you need to sort of separate that out. Okay, there's cultural back conditioning and con uh, c conventionalities of language, social habit, and so forth. But the person is more than that, and they may be more than that in a constructive way or a destructive way, in a way that yields insight or a way that blocks insight, that, that's recalcitrant and closed to insight. But this, this is a very difficult question. I've written a little book that I may publish at some point uh, on Joan of Arc as a study in spiritual discernment. And what I came to, uh, you know, what, what do we make of Joan and her voices? Uh, is this the real deal? And I found the most useful thing to, and, you know, I'm an epistemologist, and so I always think of spiritual discernment as the key epistemology for issue for religion. Uh, you know, how, how do you feel, find as uh, one of the great writers on it, tr true coin from counterfeit coin, you know, spiritually. Uh, and I found useful in this study, looking at Joan's life, uh, what, uh, what they call virtue epistemology, which is they point out a lot of most epistemological questions real in real life don't have to do with Descartes and radical doubt and maybe there's an evil demon or I'm a brain in a vat or some these weirdo things. They have to do with how do I make sound judgments in cases of conflicting evidence and how do I hold my beliefs without just flip-flopping with, with every breeze that, that comes through? Or and on the other hand, it's, it becomes a kind of golden mean. I, I can't just... Uh, stick to my views, hell or high water, no matter what evidence assaults them. Uh, so we all have to kind of maintain an equilibrium. And so the, the economic virtues are ultimately questions of character. And uh, Aristotle says that about judging witnesses in a trial. Uh, the most crucial thing is the character of the witness. Is this a guy you can trust? And we have an evolutionary biologists give us reasons we have very good capacities for this skill. Uh, we're, we're able to exercise it in part because we wouldn't have survived otherwise. The first question about any other being, uh, you know, human or animal, is friend or foe. <laughs> well, you know, what are this being's intentions? And the, if it's a human, if they're pretending to be friends, can you trust them? Is this somebody you're going to trust? Well, so I did a little study of Joan, and I found Joan's um, the most solid. She, it's just like she's like some furniture. She's carved from a single block of wood. 
you know, there aren't bizarre pushes and pull. You know, it's the same Joan from youth on. And uh, anyway, I come out rather on Joan's side in that, as a result. But, how, but anyway, that's just one thing that might or might not be helpful to Nancy's context. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Nan Ackerman uh, asks, what is your view about the relationship between religious systems and the needs of humanity? Um, uh, could this person say more? What, what, the humanity has many, many needs. That's true. Yeah, and so I'm not sure. <laughs> I, have, I have the feeling that the questioner probably has a certain type of need in mind. I mean, in general, one of the, you know, what are the needs of humanity? The first need, from my point of view, being a religious person, is the need to relate to transcendence, however you want to characterize that, to divine reality. I mean, there, there's nothing more important, and uh, you should do that before you put food on the table. Well, I'm overstating it, because you may first need to put food on the table and make sure you survive to the next day. But meanwhile, your high priority should be relating to the divine reality. But uh, I suspect there are many other more, you know, needs of humanity that uh, go beyond that, and I, I'm just not sure what the questioner might have in mind. Okay. Uh, look, I think uh, we exhausted our questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Nan uh, Ackerman is not explaining, but I think um, you nailed it. I think uh, the question is about the spiritual needs of humanity. Ah. So the relationship yeah. between religious systems and the spiritual needs of humanity. Well, the, uh, some people assume that theology without walls, look at that language, um, is kind of iconoclastic. Let's tear down the walls. <laughs> but uh, that's, not, that's not what it is at all. Without walls really means take in all the evidence without walls, all the spiritual insight without blocking it because it doesn't fit my confession's beliefs. So that's the only thing without walls means. Uh, the, uh, I guess I'm kind of pro-religion um, because we wouldn't know any of these things. We wouldn't have the sacred scriptures of the different traditions. We wouldn't have the spiritual disciplines, the iconic models of people who lived these highly spiritual lives and that we become imitators of to the, ex to the extent we can. Um, uh, and of course, Religious institutions have many other functions as well in terms of the vitality of a community, raising a family, um, coping yes. with birth. Sorry to, interrupt, sorry to interrupt, Jerry, but yes, Nan Ackerman yeah. uh, clarifies that he needs both spiritual and practical needs. And, and that's what you were talking about. Yes, yes, yes. Good, good. Yeah, well, I think the religions do help meet those things, but we all know they also have problems. Uh, some of the problems from the fact that they're human institutions uh, and, you know, human beings are fallible. <laughs> and even if they wear priestly collars or uh, are gurus of some type, uh, they have a side of them that's, that's uh, completely fallible and subject to the pushes and pulls that are part of human nature, our biological nature and so forth. So, and although... It's easy to be super critical of religion in part because hypocrisy is such a terrible sin. And the higher your standards, you know, if you wear a priestly collar or some other, you know, office uh, standing within a tradition, and then you're behaving no better than the guy at the bar, <laughs> that, uh, that that's a, a, a longer fall. And, but nevertheless, who else is going to be a priest or a guru or something but a human being? And, and you, you have to you do your best to cope with the problems. But, uh, uh, and in their, of course, warfare with one another, the churches have been, I shouldn't say churches, but the religions as formally organized have often been vicious. You even see films in uh, Southeast Asia a Buddhist in their orange robes beating you know, up on some Hindu or something. Uh, and, you know, just unbelievable. Um, and uh, so, may, but I would say these days with the uh, 
certainly the organized religious community uh, internationally uh, has a high degree of mutual acceptance and welcoming. Whatever their official doctrinal stances, uh, a very high degree of that. And I would say that's a very positive thing for meeting the needs of humanity. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jedi. Uh, we have one last question, I believe, uh, by Barbara Imlach. Um, she uh, says, she writes, you referred to confessional nature of religions earlier. Can you be more specific about what you mean by this? Uh, coming from childhood experience of confessionals in the Catholic Church, I'm curious as to what you mean. Well, it's actually a term that was new to me uh, since I spent my life mainly as a philosophy professor and so forth. Uh, that it's a term used in these interfaith discussions and it doesn't really have to do with the confessional as a, you know, a, as a practice within the Catholic Church. It means people who live by a religion that you need to be true to the, roughly speaking, the creed, which is the confession of your own denomination or religion. And then the term gets somewhat broadened from that to just being true to your religion when you're theologizing, being bounded. So it's the opposite of theology without walls or trans-religious theology. It's, it's theology bounded by the norms, sources, text, and so forth of one's own tradition. I see. Thank you, Jerry. I think uh, we should uh, stop our discussion one hour and 25 minutes. Uh, we, we should not uh, bother our audience any longer. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, lively discussion. Robert, uh, will you show up in the end? <laughs> thank you, Mikhail. And thank yes. you to all the participants. Thank you, gentlemen. I was fascinated by this discussion. Um, one particular comment of yours, Jerry, really interested me, and that's how the, the religions provide the main thing they provide, you might say, is that connection to the divine. And some people will just simply find that connection more in one tradition than in another. And that's yes. that's obviously true. And 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 that really I found a very useful insight for me in, in thinking about interfaith dialogue. Yeah, often they find it right in their home tradition after going yeah. out rejecting it and so forth. They'll come back, and this is really where I connect with God the best. Yeah. And other times they will just jump to something you might say completely different, wholly unrelated, <laughs> you know, but it speaks to them in some deep way. And I guess I tend to trust that spiritual sense that people can have in their own lives, uh, short of the flaky characters. <laughs> and so, but no, the, you're right. The, the nature of faith is a fascinating and mister, mysterious thing. And it's just not something that you can predict I yes. guess you could say right. it's you can't do a kind of social economic profile and say, oh, well, you're uh, meant to go off and be this. <laughs> yeah, it just it's that's that's very true. But that was that was a particularly interesting insight that I, I really enjoyed and appreciated. And I, I really enjoyed the discussion, gentlemen. And I want to thank you very much for this today and uh, I want to thank our audience for participating as well. They had some very interesting questions, actually. I, I was pleased by the quality of the questions. Yes. And I look forward to seeing them next week. And meanwhile, I want to thank everyone and wish them all the best in their service for others. Service well, to well, others. Oh, some uh, uh, contact information it occurred to me that I, we should put something where people know how to reach me if they want to follow up on anything. We can put it on the page for the for the webinar so that people can go to that page and uh, uh, if they're curious to, to ask you more questions, they can do it there. They'll also be able to ask questions, pose questions on the YouTube page where the recording is. And if they do that, we'll forward the questions to you. Okay, excellent, excellent. Good. I see. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Generous thank you notes too. Yep. That's, that's very good. Sure, very good. Well, thank you again, and bye-bye. Have a, uh, an excellent week. See everyone next week. See you. Bye-bye.